Mr. Martin Griffiths, the Secretary General and the United Nations Special Envoy to Yemen, welcome to Al Arabiya, sir. Thank you very much for having me back on the program. I would like to start with your latest visit to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and your meeting with President Hadi of Yemen uh, this week. Uh, what sort of compromise do you think or do you see possible between President Hadi, who is fighting to maintain the integrity of his state and its institutions, and the Southern Trans Transitional Council dedicated to re-establishment of an independent nation in the south of Yemen? Well, let, let me first be clear. My visit to the president, uh, which, is, uh, which was a privilege for me, as it always is, it was a very warm meeting. I wanted to take to him the uh, regards and respects of my superior, Secretary General Guterres. Uh, and we specifically talked uh, about Hodeida. But it, when it came to the issue of the South, uh, my view, as you know, has been very clear. The U view of the United Nations is that uh, the state institutions and territory should not and cannot be taken by force and that the recovery of state institutions under the uh, government of Yemen is imperative. Now, the task of making that happen, uh, to, to my uh, uh, delight and respect, has been given to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think the indispensable mediator in this context is indeed Saudi Arabia. And the, when you ask about what compromise, uh, I think the compromise is to be found uh, in a situation where the government of Yemen government for all the people of Yemen allows a discussion at the right time, in the right way, in a political manner, not uh, subject to duress or force, uh, allowing the people of Yemen to discuss the kind of governance arrangements they want for their country. I think that's not a compromise, that's actually good government. And I'm absolutely sure that's what President Hadi wants to see happen. The first round of talks in Jeddah between the leaders of the Southern Transitional Council and the legitimate government did not take place. Now there is another call by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, to convene a new round in Jeddah. You just came back from Saudi Arabia. What can you tell us about the new call for the talks between the government and the Southern Transitional Council? I'm, I'm not privy to the inner councils of the mediation, uh, which is led by... Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and which seeks to reconcile uh, the aspirations and interests and rights, indeed, of the government of Yemen and the people in the south, including within the Southern Transitional Council. It's not for me to pronounce on that. Uh, I am there to encourage uh, that process to be recognized for what it is, which is a process of inclusion, of understanding, but also, frankly, based on the constitutional rights that are enshrined in the Yemen's constitution. Now, as you say, the first round of talks in Jeddah didn't bring the two parties together. And it's my understanding that this is because there was a need, and a need I certainly understand very well, for uh, a return to a secure environment in the South, uh, in which state institutions are indeed run again under the aegis of the state, uh, before such talks can be held. But uh, I'm among those who want those talks to happen as soon as possible, as soon as conditions permit. You warned uh, in your briefing to the Security Council in the end of July about the fragmentation of Yemen. But, uh, but there are those who argue that maybe an independent South Yemen is the best solution, even to carve two or three Yemen's, uh, Yemeni states and not one united Yemen. What do you think of this view? Do you, do you agree with it, disagree with it? Uh, and, and what can, can it be done uh, uh, legally? And what co role could the United Nations play in this? Well, first of all, I, I'm not a Yemeni. I think that's the crucial point here. I yes. don't have a vote in Yemen. It's not for me to have a view, frankly, about how Yemen is to be governed. The United Nations has a strong opinion because of the values that has formed us, that any discussion about the future of the state, the nature of the state, the extent of the state, the geographic extent of states, should be managed in a way which is accountable to the citizens of that state, to the Yemenis, not to me. Uh, and the UN's role here, you ask about the United Nations role, 
is to try to help the people of Yemen to manage those discordant views in a way which do not, uh, dis do not threaten mm. the birthright of people in Yemen, nor the economy and future of Yemen. So we need, to, we need to address these kind of aspirations in a way which is, which is positive and constructive rather than on, based on the use of force. I have spent a lifetime uh, dealing with conflicts, most of which, frankly, have been about identity, secession, separatism, the kind of thing that we see uh, also being talked about in the South. And there is one thing that comes through very, very clearly from that experience, including in my own country, by the way, which is this, that a rupture of the state, which is unilateral and achieved by force, never achieves international rec recognition and almost never, almost never is successful in terms of providing for those who seek that rupture. Now in Yemen, as in any other country, we must seek stability and we must seek accountable government so that the people of Yemen, not me, not the United Nations, not foreigners, can decide the fate of their country. The Wall Street Journal and, and many other leading media outlets are reporting that the United States is planning, and I'm quoting them, the United States is planning to hold direct negotiations with Yemen-Iran-aligned Houthi movement in Oman in a bid to resolve the country's four-year-old conflict. The Wall Street Journal reported this on Tuesday, citing U.S. official uh, involved in the talks. Your reaction to such reports uh, and do you have a view on another channel of negotiation being opened outside the United Nations Security Council approved negotiation track headed by you? Uh, well, I, I read that story, of course, uh, with great interest. Uh, it came as something of a surprise to me. Uh, I'm not sure it's entirely accurate. Uh, I'm not aware that there are such plans so well advanced for such an engagement. Uh, I think if there were to be an engagement of the kind described by the Wall Street Journal, it would need to be one which has, of course, the approval of the allies of the United States. And I'm sure that that would be something which the U.S. government, if it is going in this direction, would have in the front of its mind. Uh, but, but I could, should make a, a larger point, perhaps, which is this. Uh, I am one who favors engagement with Ansar Allah, the Houthi movement, and its allies and its partners in Sana'a. I think it's important that they hear the voices of the international community about the future of Yemen and about their future. And they don't need to only hear it from me. And I don't feel threatened. I don't feel insecure about the, these other contacts, which frankly already do happen. Many member states have contact uh, with Ansar Allah. And many uh, representatives uh, visit their, their representatives in different places. It doesn't undermine the primacy of the UN process. I'm not insecure about that. But I am profoundly of the view that ensuring that people talk to each other, understand each other better, in particular when they disagree with each other, is a basis for progress in resolving conflicts and uh, moving backwards towards peace. Also, Last week, you met in Riyadh with Prince Khalid bin Salman, Saudi Deputy Minister of Defense, who is visiting D.C., Washington, D.C., uh, uh, this week uh, for high-level talks with high uh, American officials, including uh, State Secretary of State Pompeo, Secretary of Defense, and also the Chairman of Chief of Staffs. Um, how do you uh, look at these sort of talks, and are they helpful to your efforts? Yes, I, I, I'm sure they will be very helpful. They're certainly very important. Uh, and, and frankly, I'm grateful uh, to both Prince Khaled and to the US leadership, uh, who will be spending time together this week, as you described, in Washington, to focus on Yemen. I think more attention to Yemen is what we need. I think we'll be in trouble if the world starts looking in a different direction. So I. I'm very encouraged by visits of this kind. And I should tell you that uh, I'm lucky and privileged 
the United Nations is privileged by the fact that, as you say, I met Prince Khalid last week before a visit. We talked about his visit. I've been meeting recently in Riyadh this week with senior U.S. officials. We're in touch with Washington on a virtually daily basis. So I'm able to contribute my small uh, amount and the sort of things that I would find useful uh, to come out of such a visit. So yes, it's important. I'm sure it will be constructive, and I'm very much looking forward to the outcome. The negotiations with the Houthis, you presented a proposal to both parties, and you requested that you get your answer by the 25th uh, of, uh, of the month, as you informed the Security Council in your briefing. Can you give us a clearer picture or idea of the proposal that you presented and, and the response that you got from the government of Yemen, as we know now, uh, through our sources, that it was the government of Yemen who re responded. And in the absence of a healthy response, do we reach a dead end? I have now, and I can um, confirm to you, responses from both parties, not just from one. Uh, the governor of Yemen, as you say, uh, provided their response early, in fact, uh, to put great credit to them for that. Um, uh, the, 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 the son of front response from, from Ansarallah was a little bit later, but uh, I was in regular contact with them about the issues that they were addressing. So I must say, I had no uh, concern about whether this was a slippage or that this somehow betokened uh, a lack of interest or a lack of commitment. And in any case, now I have responses from both parties and within a few days, the comments that both have made about the proposal I put forward to them uh, will be discussed in detail by the uh, RCC, the committee set up uh, for Hodeida by the Stockholm Agreement, will be discussed on our UN vessel in the coming days to resolve those differences. And they're not so much differences, they're comments about how we're going to go about implementing the provisions of this proposal. And Talal, you asked what this proposal really does. It focuses on the, the first phase, the phase one of redeployments of the Hodeida Agreement. Uh, as you can remember, uh, there was a unilateral uh, deployment, a first redeployment out of the ports some weeks ago. This now completes that process. There will be uh, the, uh, the opportunity to monitor what has happened. There will be the opportunity to build capacity in those ports. We'll be looking at the issue of revenue. I'm uh, confident that we will see the verification mechanism of the UN being able to move at the right moment into those ports. And we will also see some disengagement uh, between the two parties to help, frankly, very frankly, uh, reduce the tension on the front lines, which will give a greater chance for the ceasefire, which by and large, despite uh, far too much violence, if you're living there, any violence is far too much. That's been holding, but it needs to be strengthened. One of the things that will be discussed in this meeting on the boat in the next few days, which perhaps is almost more important than anything else, will be the final establishment of a ceasefire monitoring mechanism, liaison officers from both sides who will be living and working together, along with my colleagues in the UN, uh, to, ver to monitor, verify, comment and report on any violations or incidents that happen within the governorate. So that, if we can get that moving, that will be really something. And if I could say, when I was in Riyadh, this was the topic of my pr principal topic of my conversation with President Hadi uh, and, and his uh, officials. And I think the leadership he's shown in being, frankly, often uh, more patient than I would have expected, uh, and in giving instructions to his team uh, to, to be constructive, I was, that was confirmed to me in Riyadh. And I know, because I was in Sana'a a few days before, that we will see the same from that side. Are we letting the implementation of the Stockholm agreement be the enemy of the broader imperative which is the putting an end to the conflict because as you said in the security council yemen cannot wait i'm very glad you've asked that question because yemen really cannot wait and um I, i'm not the only person who is seriously worried about the prospects for uh resolving the issues which have fractured yemen and in the events in the south as i said to the council uh, on the 20th of August are extraordinarily alarming and a wake-up call 
for all those who think that we can take a leisurely pace towards really addressing the political issues that need to be addressed. Now, as you say, the Stockholm Agreement was there to build confidence. Uh, eight months later, some people say that it's also uh, demonstrated uh, the absence of confidence between the parties, which have led them to find great difficulty, each of them at different times, to make what would seem to be straightforward agreements. Now, uh, as, as your su question suggests, I'm passionately of the view that progress on Hodeida, essential as it is, a focus of United Nations activity as it will always be, must not be uh, a factor stopping us moving forward on the political process. I discussed that with President Hadi. I made the strong case for that, as you know, in the Security Council, with the unanimous uh, support of the members, uh, in, my, in my view. And I think we must move forward urgently on that. I was able, in addition, yesterday in Riyadh to meet uh, a group of uh, Yemeni politicians led by Speaker Barakani. And we, had, we were very much of the same mind of the need to focus on politics. As they said, let us return Yemen to politics. And I completely agree. You are expecting, sir, uh, some news this week about the detainees and prisoners and kidnapped person exchange. What can you tell us about that? Uh, I'm rather frustrated um, by this particular issue. We, we, we have a proposal out. We've, we've had it out to the parties, f um, the details of which I don't want to go into. Um, uh, for, re for obvious reasons, I think, but which I think provide a very good first uh, batch of prisoners who can and should be released. And it's been the subject of extraordinarily detailed negotiation and betting and discussion between the parties. Now, we haven't yet finalized an agreement on this, and, and I don't want to ma make any public comment about it uh, and, and, uh, because I'm still hopeful, and it's still a very much a live issue. Even today in Riyadh, it was being discussed. Uh, and I have been discussing it in Sana'a last week as well. It's a live issue, but think of it this way. Think of the opportunity for those people, through no fault of their own, who fought for causes that they believed in, and who have been jailed for anything up to four or five years, suddenly to have the opportunity to return to their families from the point of view of building confidence, which we were just discussing, confidence among the people of Yemen that something is going right, the release of prisoners, for me, rates very, very highly as a confidence-building measure, as well as one of essential humanity. So I'm still hoping that the proposal that I think is a fair one will be accepted and that we can instantly, with, uh, with our partner, the International Red Cross, put it into motion. The understanding of ties. Any movement on that file? None. None, I'm afraid. Um, and I'm a, I, I say that with regret, personal regret, political regret, institutional regret, because we have been unable, because of the situation in Thais, it's very, very uh, uh, high temperature there, as you know. Uh, the war is going on in Thais, not only uh, between the Houthi movement and their forces and those of the government of Yemen, but within and between on the latter. Uh, and so that there hasn't been the kind of uh, movement forward that we began to see a small sign of when we were together in Sweden. Having said that, having said that, and Taith is very important, obviously, it's a central city in Yemen and it is an iconic place for the people of Yemen. So having said that, I'm very pleased that there is another approach to Thais, not led by us, but one which we support. And I will be very proud to attend a meeting, in fact, here in Amman, under the United European Union auspices, of a, of a civil society peace-building initiative. Thais has a rich history of activity by community groups, women's groups, civil society groups, to try to build peace and cross lines and enable civility in life. We're bringing people together from Thais to talk about the prospects for that. And, I, and I'm quite excited about this, because in the middle of war, if those, the protagonists of the conflict, aren't able to sit down together, then we, then we look 
to the civilians affected by war and desperate for a way out who will remind us of the possibilities of their action and let us support them and let us see where we can go with that approach to TICE in the weeks to come. How do you view the fact that the Houthi militias have now appointed an ambassador to Iran, something that contravenes with the United Nations Charter and legitimize the occupation of the Houthis of the capital and other cities? What is your view on this, sir? Well, I, I, I rather thought you might ask me that question, um, and I haven't <laughs> been drawn on it before. Uh, but l l let, me say quite let me say quite clearly, there's no legal status to such an appointment. I mean, for a United Nations official, uh, it's, it, uh, the, the, the Ansarallah can do what they like in these, in these contexts, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make a difference to the legal status of diplomacy, of ambassadorships, of representation. Uh, that's a matter, obviously, for the government recognized by the General Assembly, for the government led by President Hadi. But, so, in that sense, um, it is an interesting but not uh, an, uh, an important event in, in, in legal terms. Concerning the, uh, the Houthis' ballistic missiles and drones attacks against civilian targets and airports and economic interests in Saudi Arabia, realistically speaking, is there anything you or the United Nations can do to stop the Houthi drone and missile attacks. Attacks on civilian infrastructure by anybody are condemned by the United Nations and are subject to international humanitarian law and ultimately accountability. And uh, it's uh, when we see attacks on civilian infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, that is exactly what we feel. We feel that very strongly. Uh, and we, we, we are being, I have been very clear in my statements publicly and privately uh, to the various many people I meet that, I, uh, that, that I, I find such attacks unacceptable. Time is catching up with us, sir. My last question is, would you like to see the Security Council show more teeth and be more forceful to help you in your efforts to bring peace and bring people around the table for a political negotiated solution. Yemen's very lucky in this specific way. We have a united Security Council, united permanent members, united Security Council as a whole. They all want a political solution to Yemen, and they want it now. They want it earlier rather than later. And they are united in, in those calls, as you know, better than I do. Uh, and I need that support because I need the attention that the Security Council uniquely globally in our global system uniquely can draw upon a particular issue and upon a particular conflict in this case. They can focus international attention and they can also provide for the focus of the international conscience. Now that soft power, and it is only soft power, is a vital necessity. You know when I, I'm lucky enough to brief the council every 30 days and as you know as well as I do Whatever I say, it, word by word by word, is parsed and looked at and condemned or accepted or ignored. Uh, <laughs> it's a great opportunity for me to put my views clearly. But we don't need more teeth, actually. What we need more is encouragement and a light that's shined for the leaders uh, in Sana'a, uh, in Ansarallah, in Riyadh, in Aden, President Hadi, a light that will shine the path, light the path that I think they need to go down to stop this war and give Yemen its future back. Mr. Martin Griffiths, uh, Secretary General and the United Nations Special Envoy to Yemen, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, with us, sir. Thank you for your insight and we thank you for this interview, sir. Thank you, Talal. Still my favorite interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. God bless. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.